Good morning and, or a good afternoon and welcome to uh, Nurturing Nature Knowledge. Um, today is the final of our three uh, report uh, uh, report sessions um, and today we'll be focusing on uh, the research program and the research projects that took place at Pierce Cedar Creek Institute. Uh, my name is Matt Dykstra. I am the field station manager uh, at Pierce Cedar Creek Institute. Um, the one challenge that we have today is that we have seven programs that we're going to try to get through in an hour and a half and um, it's going to be pretty tight so really we're in all honesty we're going to only be able to do one question um, uh, per research group and so um, I encourage you if you have a question to get it in um, and don't wait until the end uh, because uh, at the end of the program, by the time I see it, it may actually be too late and I'll have already asked a question. So get, get your questions in early if you can. Um, <clears throat> this year we had uh, a number of different projects. We had nine researchers working on six environment research grants, three Nature and Words, two Gordon Art Fellowships, two DB Land Management Fellowships, a Ballot Water Resource Fellowship, um, and two uh, field technicians working with our watershed management plan, right? So that's a, a lot of people. And today we're going to hear from those researchers up at the top that are working, that worked on those six environment research projects. Hi everybody, my name is Rachel Cotoni. I'm here with my lab partner Ethan Jacobs and our lab advisor Brad Swanson. We are from Central Michigan University and today we're going to be talking to you about the factors influencing wild rice growth. Studying wild rice is important because in the past hundred years, wild rice has been in decline. This is due to changes in hydrology, climate, pollution, coastal development, and competition between native and invasive species. Wild rice is also a cultural staple for the Anishinaabek people. They use it for nutritional use and ceremonies. In order to better understand the reasons for decline or success in wild rice populations, we collected water quality data and soil data from various populations around the Lower Peninsula. Our null hypotheses were that nutrient levels in the soil do not impact the growth of wild rice and water chemistry does not impact the growth of wild rice. For our project, we collected water chemistry data and soil chemistry data at the following sites. Tubbs Lake, Grand River Stearns Bayou, Arran Lake, Brewster Lake, Cedar Creek, Kalamazoo River, Butterfield Lake, Gun Lake, Long Lake, Fish Lake, and Horseshoe Lake. For the first part of our methods, we collected water chemistry data using a YSI Professional Plus meter. We got measurements of pH, temperature, specific conductance, nitrate, ammonium, chloride, and dissolved oxygen in the water. For each of the 11 sites that were shown in the last slide, measurements were taken at a control site, the rice bed, and along two transect lines every 20 meters for 100 meters. For the second part of our data collection, we kayaked out to the center of our test site and used a ponar dredge to collect soil samples from each of our sites. We then packaged up the samples and took them back to the lab for further testing. Once back at the lab, we tested our soil samples for pH, ammonia, phosphorus, potassium, sulfate, nitrate, calcium, aluminum, nitrite, chloride, and ferric iron levels. Once all of our data had been collected, we did a correlation matrix of all pairwise combinations and excluded one of the two variables if they had a correlation value that was greater than 0 0.5. We then used principal components to analyze our data. Principal components are a way to compress information from many different variables one measures into a single variable and allows one to look for patterns in the data. For example, if we look at this graph, we see that all of the blue circles 
are on the far left of the graph and there are no yellow or gray points mixing with the blue. This means that the variables incorporated in the principal components analysis strongly separate out the small population from the medium and large populations. In contrast, there is considerable overlap between where the yellow triangles occur and the gray squares occur. This suggests that the variables included in the principal components have a more difficult time separating out locations with medium and large rice populations. The conclusion would be that one could predict whether planting rice at a particular spot would produce a small population, but would not be able to predict whether it would be a medium-sized population or a large population. When looking at our first principal component model, there was no strong separation between the control site and our rice bed data. Our second principal component model looked at our soil data and the densities of each rice bed. It showed that there was no strong separation between each of the rice beds. Moving on to our water data, the principal component analysis showed that there was no strong separation between the rice bed and the control site. For our final principal component analysis, we looked at rice bed densities based on the water data and found that there was no separation between rice bed densities. Based on our analysis, we've determined that there are no differences in measured soil nutrients between rice and control sites, no differences in measured soil nutrients among rice beds with different population sizes, no difference in measured water chemistry between rice and control sites, and no differences in measured water chemistry among rice beds with different population sizes. This means that any area within the lakes could support rice and any lake could have a large rice population. This means that management rather than nutrients are likely responsible for the observed difference in the rice beds among our study sites. Lastly, we would like to thank Pierce Cedar Creek Institute and Central Michigan University for providing the funding and support for our research. All right, thank you. Um, Ethan and Rachel, if you could actually uh, turn on your microphones and then uh, we can uh, have you uh, uh, answer a question for us. We have a couple of minutes. Um, all right, thank you. Um, so a question for you from Sarah. Are there other chemicals you could test for, um, especially herbicides, um, or is there a way to potentially measure physical disturbance, something like wave action? Can you repeat that question? Okay, sure. Um, and it's in the, uh, it is actually in the chat, so you can actually take a look at it oh, in the okay. chat too. So the question is, are there other chemicals you could test for, especially herbicides, um, or potentially measure phys or, or potentially measure physical disturbance, something like wave action. Um, I'm sure that there's always more chemicals we could test. Um, specific chemicals, I'm not sure. I I would assume that there are a lot of different herbicides that we could look at. Um, I don't know if Ethan you have any specific ones that you? I think of? in order for us to test for other chemicals and herbicides, we'd have to do a little bit more research into uh, the kit that we were using because initially we had a, a bit of a hard time in the beginning finding a kit that would allow us to test the chemicals we were looking at this time around. But I, I, I think it would be possible, yes. OK, um, let's see. Uh, all right. Um, uh, sorry, I'm just looking at the chat. So there's a few things, a little, some questions that came that came up. Um, yeah. So 
in your in your presentation, you mentioned that there's something about management. What what are some of the things just maybe that you might be speculating are impacting the whether or not wild rice grows? So we started discussing boating traffic, um, which I guess has kind of relates to um, the question that was asked about somehow um, measuring like physical disturbance. Um, so that's definitely something that we think we're going to look more into and see if there is a way in the future to possibly look at things like that. Okay. Yeah, yeah we definitely saw a trend. Like the lakes that had more households on them tended to have lower amounts of price, whereas the lakes that were kind of in the middle of nowhere and you'd get your one or two fishermen every other week, that those seem to have a better population. All right. Well, thank you both for uh, answering those questions. Um, we're going to move on to our next uh, presentation. And uh, our next one is, uh, all right, here we go, is our box turtles um, with from uh, Megan and Faith. Hello, my name is Megan Moma and my partner is Faith Kuzma and we are here from Grand Valley State University. Today we want to talk to you about the growth, survival, movement patterns, and habitat use of head-started eastern box turtles. Before we get into the specifics of the project, let's talk a little bit about the bigger picture. Why are turtles important? Well, many of us have probably learned that high biodiversity increases ecosystem resilience. In other words, having many different plant and animal species allows natural systems to bounce back and recover from disturbances. It keeps them healthy and functioning properly, and turtles contribute to this. Unfortunately, we are currently experiencing unprecedented rates of biodiversity decline around the world, and the eastern box turtle is one species that has been struggling in recent decades. Many factors have contributed to eastern box turtle population declines, and these include habitat fragmentation and degradation, high levels of road mortality, the collection of individuals for the pet trade, and increased levels of nest predation. As a result of these trends, active management techniques are becoming necessary to preserve struggling populations. One common management practice for turtle conservation is head starting. Head starting involves raising turtles in captivity to allow individuals' growth rates to increase while in a safe, protected environment. This allows species to grow to a size that is less susceptible to predation and thus mortality compared to when they are born. Their increased size at the time of release should enhance their survival and if successful, could become an effective conservation management tool for many species. We hypothesized that head starting hatchling eastern box turtles would lead to increased growth and subsequently higher survival rates compared to wild turtles. We also hypothesized that the head starting would not have major impacts on the turtles movement patterns and habitat use upon their release. Last year, a group of scientists at Pierre Cedar Creek Institute were able to locate and protect eight eastern box turtle nests. During their expected date of hatching, individuals went to check on the nests every day to search for emerging baby box turtles. From these nests came the nine hatchlings that were the main focus for this project. These baby turtles overwintered and were cared for at the John Ball Zoo for nine months. During these nine months, the turtles were individually housed in 13 by 9 inch snapware containers that were placed on an angle. This angle created a land area at the top, which consisted of sphagnum moss and plastic plants, and a water area at the bottom. UVB and incandescent light bulbs were placed approximately 15 inches above each turtle's container to facilitate proper shell development, as well as to provide the turtles with a thermal gradient. The turtles were fed a diet of earthworms, reptomen pieces, and salad. They were regularly weighed, measured, and examined by the John Ball Zoo staff to monitor growth and overall health. In May 2020, the head started turtles were brought back to Pierce Senior Creek Institute. Here we attached a 3 gram radio transmitter to each turtle with epoxy. We also gave each turtle a notch on their shell so that we would be able to identify individuals after releasing them. After the radio transmitters and notching, we released the turtles at the edge of the forest. This location was picked because we have seen many other adult eastern box turtles there, which indicates it is a good environment for head starts. 
Two or three times a week following their release, Faith and I would radio track each turtle to check up on them. Each time the turtle was located, we took a GPS point along with physiological and behavioral observations to be later evaluated. After the field season, we used the weight measurements collected by John Balzu staff members to calculate the average monthly growth rate of each turtle throughout their time in captivity. We found that the growth rates were predominantly positive and increased each month from October through April. April was the peak growth month for each turtle, but growth slowed down slightly in May just before the turtles were released. Even so, each turtle gained between 51 and 63 grams during head starting, which was nearly a tenfold increase in weight. On the left of this photo is a turtle we happened upon one day while surveying. As you can see, it is approximately two to three years in age. On the right is our head started turtle, which is only 10 months old. This comparison shows the increased growth rates that our head starts experienced compared to growth rates in the wild. We estimated that the head started turtles, despite being less than a year old, were approximately the size of a three to four year old box turtle in the wild, which supports our hypothesis that head starting would lead to increased growth rates as shown in these photos. Our hypothesis that the head started turtles would experience higher survival was also supported by our data. We conservatively estimated that post-release survival of the head started turtles for the first two months was 78%. We say conservatively because the transmitters fell off of two of the head starts, so their survival status is unclear. However, we have no reason to believe that the turtles are not alive as we located both transmitters and they did not show any signs of predation. Even so, a 78% survival rate for the turtle's first year of life is much higher than most estimates of survival in the wild. Numerous studies have approximated a 2-3% to survival rate of turtles during their first year or two of life, and a model created for an eastern box turtle population in northern Michigan calculated a survival probability of close to 0% for the first year of life. Consequently, it appears that the increased size achieved by head starting has had positive impacts on the survival of our young box turtles. Although there have been reported negative impacts of head starting, such as species going outside of their home ranges, we did not see anything to indicate a negative impact on these individuals. During our time in the field checking up on the head starts, we also noted their behavior to be strikingly similar to that of a wild box turtle. They were eating their regular food preferences, such as slugs and even mushrooms. Additionally, when initially disturbed, they all closed up their shell, which is a good sign of protecting themselves against predation, as seen in the middle picture. Finally, some turtles also made it extremely difficult to locate them, as they became experts in selecting habitats and using them as tools of camouflage, which can be seen in the last picture on the right. Using the GPS points we collected, we created a home range estimate for each turtle and analyzed movement rates throughout the summer. We found that home range sizes ranged from 0.19 to 2.54 hectares, although a majority of the turtles stayed within a 0.3 to 0.5 hectare area. These home ranges were largely as we would expect. Adult box turtles typically reside in a 1 to 1.5 hectare area, and our head starts mainly occupied an area of less than 1 hectare. This smaller home range size seems logical due to the turtle's small size, limited mobility, and pre-reproductive age. We also found that the turtles moved around significantly more in July than they did in June. These results are consistent with those of another study that followed young box turtles in northern Michigan, and it is possible that this increased movement is correlated with increasing average temperatures in July. After collecting our data, we compiled the GPS waypoints shown in the last slide. From here, we drew conclusions on what proportion of different habitats the turtles were occupying. From this table, it can be seen that the largest proportion of head started turtle locations occurred in the wetland habitats, followed by forests, and only a small portion of them inhabited the prairie. These statistics were mirrored in the locations of wild adult eastern box turtles and are also consistent with other wild eastern box turtle populations in northern Michigan. When locating the adults at PCCI, the majority were found in either wetland or forest ecosystems, while they are only seasonally found in the prairie when laying eggs. 
This behavior is also consistent with that recorded by Larman et al. while monitoring neonate eastern box turtles during their second active season in northern Michigan. Overall, the results of this study are very promising. It appears that head starting these eastern box turtles has increased their growth and survival without having negative impacts on their movement and habitat selection. However, these results are not totally conclusive. Further studies are needed to determine if these head-started turtles are able to survive and successfully reproduce and to evaluate whether or not the head-starting has had any unintended consequences on the turtle's long-term health and behavior. We would like to extend a huge thanks to Pure Cedar Creek Institute and their staff members for funding our work, giving us access to their equipment and facilities, and donating their time and other resources to ensure the success of our project. We would also like to thank our professors, Jennifer Moore and Paul Keen Lance, for providing us with amazing opportunity and assisting us in designating and implementing this project. Finally, we would also like to express our appreciation to John Ball Zoo for housing and caring for our Eastern box turtles. Your generous donations of time, experience, and resources have been invaluable to our research and conservation efforts. All right, um, welcome. And uh, we have a, a question from Facebook um, that, uh, that asks, how long would it be necessary to raise a, some turtles in captivity to make a long-term difference in survival? Well, that is a good question. And that's something that's still really being looked into because head starting has been done for a few years, but it's still a relatively new technique that's being used. And so we had started our turtles for nine months and that seems to have made up for approximately two or three years worth of growth in the wild. And so it's possible that nine months would be enough for box turtles, but we also don't have enough data on these individuals to see if that'll be enough for the long term. So I think that's really a species specific question and it also depends on like the specific methods that people are using to head start um so yeah all right um let's see the, another question um do you have plans to monitor these head starts and if so how long would it make sense to track them so yeah. i can answer oh. yeah go ahead megan I'm sorry, I was just gonna say that um, we do have plans to just keep tracking them uh, at least once a week or a couple times a week, just until they get to their nesting habitat. And then once they go into hibernation, um, we're hoping to locate that location. And then once they go out of it, maybe um, move them to like adult transmitters, which are on our adult Eastern box turtles at Pure Cedar Creek and make that more of a long-term um, goal and have them be monitored just like the adults are, which there's every summer. Yep, and ideally we would want to be able to track them all the way until their reproductive maturity because head starting is going to be the most successful if we can get those individuals to join the breeding population so that they can actually increase the population size. All right, and then um, can you give us an update on uh, what's happened to the nests that you worked with uh, this, this summer? Yeah, absolutely. So I think the last that I heard, uh, five of the eight have produced hatchlings. And so we have, I think, around 24 babies right now. And 20 of those are at Don Ball Zoo right now. And that we are hoping to head start that winter. All right. Well, thank you to uh, both of you uh, for your work this summer. And we'll have to move on to our next presentation. Um, uh, our next presentation is from uh, Calvin College. It is actually um, a project that we did not fund, um, but did actually take place at uh, Pierce Cedar Creek, or a component of it took place at Pierce Cedar Creek Institute. And uh, they are, were interested in sharing their results with the community. And so we are um, essentially going to provide a form for them uh, to do that. So my name is William Miller. I'm a professor of biology at Calvin University. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce my summer research students from this past summer who are here to share their work on black-legged tick abundance and potential ecological correlates in Southwest Michigan. So for what we know, there are over 20 known species of ticks in Michigan, with the five most common species, including the black-legged tick and the lone star tick. 
which can vector for a variety of emerging diseases such as Powassan virus disease, Heartland virus disease, as well as some more established diseases such as Lyme's disease. Lyme's disease is the most common tick-borne disease in Michigan, and it is vectored by the black-legged tick. Understanding the environmental factors that affect its distribution is crucial to understanding the risk associated with contracting the disease. What we know from previous literature is that the black-legged tick are most abundant in deciduous forested habitat, uh, predominantly on forest edge, and their distribution is highly influenced by the host distribution and the habitat they occupy. The main host for black-legged ticks are white-tailed deer. However, other small mammals such as white-footed mice uh, can act as their host along with humans. With that being said, we wanted to take on this project utilizing the idea of the One Health perspective, which basically asks the broader question of how human, animal, and environmental health are interconnected. In other words, how does the health of each group individually and collectively affect the others? So here we have a sequence of maps of Michigan showing how the range expansion of black-legged ticks um, has expanded basically throughout time starting uh, 1998. And these were based upon previous tick surveys. Um, so what we can see here is that the population of black-legged ticks are expanding north along the lakeshore and extended, extending into inland areas with the highest abundance remaining in the southwestern region of the state. And here we have a similar idea as the last slide, except now we are dealing with Lyme disease spread uh, from 2011 to 2019. And what we can see here is that the cases of Lyme disease reflect the trends of black-legged tick expansion. Uh, so we can see a heavily concentrated abundance of cases in the southwestern re region of the state. And over time, these cases increase in number and extend into the north and eastern portions of the state. So the purpose of our project was to evaluate the distribution of black-legged ticks in southwest Michigan. And in order to understand the physical spread, we need to understand what is actually causing the spread. So with that, we wanted to provide a preliminary assessment of ecological factors that may affect tick abundance. And we had several predictions based on previous literature. Uh, one being that there would indeed be a higher abundance of ticks in southern counties along the shoreline. Two, that the higher abundance would be associated uh, with warmer and warmer annual temperature. Um, and then three, that there would be a positive correlation between abundance and forest cover. And now we'd like to talk about some of the methods involved. So our study occupied seven counties in Southwest Michigan with a total of 33 sites that consisted of county parks, natural areas, and state park and recreation areas. Within each site, we constructed anywhere from three to 11 sampling arrays, depending on the size of that specific sampling site. And these sampling arrays were evenly distributed within each site location. And the placement for each array was chosen based on accessibility and researcher discretion. To calculate the abundance of ticks, each array was standardized and measured 30 by 30 meters and consisted of four transects set up in a strip plot design. Uh, to collect the ticks, we ran a one meter by one meter drag cloth uh, down and back, stopping at intervals to collect the ticks. So the ticks are collected utilizing uh, forceps and lint rollers. And then after collection, the ticks were then identified under a dissecting microscope in the lab with a species key. And then they were labeled and stored in a zero degree Celsius freezer for future disease characterization. We then calculated abundance at each site by taking the average density um, in each array and multiplying that by 1,000 to get abundance in ticks per 1,000 meters squared. We then did an inverse distance weighted interpolation, which estimates the value for cells based on nearby known sites and mapped sites in this interpolated surface to assess tick distribution in southwest Michigan. Here are our results for abundance. Our mean site abundance was 3.03 ticks per thousand meters squared with a standard error of 0.85 ticks per standard meters. Um, and keep in mind that this is a relative abundance based on our preliminary assessment. So it can still be useful for site comparisons. 
In our range was zero between zero ticks at 11 of our sites and 22 ticks um, at all of shores along the Lake Michigan shoreline. At Pierce Cedar Creek Institute, shown here in the bottom right, the site abundance was 1.56 ticks per thousand meters squared. And our, our general trend was toward higher abundance in the southern counties, including Kalamazoo County and Barry County, and then along the Lake Michigan shoreline in Allegan and Ottawa counties. And our results suggest that the black legged tick range is expanding. Shown here is our 2020 update to the previous figure. The CDC guidelines for establishing tick populations in a county for that there has been six ticks of one life stage or at least two life stages of ticks collected within a site in the county in a single year. And our um, results show that Kent County can now be considered as established. At one of our sites in southern Kent County, we found six nymphs, and at several other sites in Kent County, we found both nymph and larval ticks. We can also consider Nuego County to be reported. We found several sites with nymph and larval ticks in Nuego County. However, since our larval ticks could not be definitively identified, future research will be needed to establish tick populations in Nuego County. We then used penalized regression to see whether any spatial land cover or bioclimate variables were associated with tick abundance or occurrence. Um, we created a three kilometer radius extraction buffer around each site and calculated the average value of the variable within that buffer. After removing collinear variables, um, we had 13 variables in our final model matrix. We then used lasso regression, which is a form of penalized regression for variable selection for both abundance and occurrence. And this trace plot shown here shows the process of variable selection in lasso regression. On the x-axis is lambda, which is the penalization term used in lasso regression. Lasso regression uses that penalization term to shrink the coefficients of unimportant variables to zero. We tested several lambdas and chose the optimized lambda using tenfold cross-validation. As we see here, as lambda approaches the optimal value, the coefficients for all but one variable are zeroed out. Latitude, which is represented by the black line, was the only variable associated with abundance. And as we see here on the plot on the right, as latitude increased, abundance tended to decrease. All right, the conclusions that we can draw. Um, pr previous studies uh, on tick expansion have shown uh, an expansion northward and inland, and our study uh, continues that trend um, up into Nuego and Kent County. Uh, we saw that abundance decreased as you moved um, south to north, and we found that the land cover and the climate variables uh, did not seem to be associated with tick abundance or distribution. Uh, additionally, um, the only variable that we found to be associated with uh, tick abundance was latitude, and because uh, neither habitat or climate variables um, were associated, this leads us to believe that tick spread may be driven more by colonization uh, than actual availability of habitat. Um, the question we kind of have is whether this forest configuration um, and whether forest configuration uh, actually has a role uh, versus actual percent forest. And we would, we would uh, assess that using uh, deer habitat and movement, uh, potentially using edgy effects. Future, future directions, uh, we would like to look at host density um, since uh, tick spread uh, can often be associated with uh, white-tailed deer populations because they're, they're mobile. Um, and uh, we would also like to look at the extrapolation of this type of uh, research on other tick species. Uh, one such tick species is the Lone Star tick. Um, they are an emerging species. They vector heartland virus, which is a potentially deadly emerging pathogen. Uh, that has been reported in neighboring states, um, although it has not been reported in Michigan yet. Um, the Lone Star Tick has been found uh, by uh, collaborating, collaborating uh, institutions in the southernmost counties 
such as Barian and Cass, and could follow a similar pattern of range expansion to Exodus scapularis. We would like to thank uh, those who funded us, the Calvin University Biology Department and the Flatiron Lake and the Rotman Trust, as well as uh, our regional collaborators and partners. I think we're getting a little feedback loop there. Um, all right, uh, let's see. Uh, there's a question here, it's a, a question comment. Um, very interesting study. I noticed that your sampling technique was sampling ground habitat by dragging the cloth. Do you know if ticks occur higher in a forest, say at deer body height? Yeah, that's a good question. We know that the majority of ticks will usually um, quest on vegetation that's about knee height. And from there, once they detect something brushing against that, they will jump um, to land on the body of a deer, or in our case, on our claw. Okay. <clears throat> let, me, let me just check the time here. Okay. Um, so I... I, I, I it seemed from your study that that uh, this latitude and, and deer might be associated with um, uh, with tick density. Could there be anything else? Um, yeah, that that could be driving uh, some of this uh, uh, tick density. Or what is it about deer that would kind of uh, maybe show some of these some of these uh, um, uh, 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 distribution patterns that you would notice or that you noticed? Uh, good question. Um, because deer are mobile, um, we just feel that they can, you know, if a tick is attached to them and they move north, um, you know, that may influence it. Uh, as well as climate, we, you know, we looked at climate variables. Um, and although we didn't find anything, um, it, there's, we have reason to believe that temperature, uh, mean temperature, and as well as uh, like the temperature of how cold the, the winters are uh, may may play effects, um, but we did we obviously were not able to find any um, in our study. Okay, one one quick final question: Do you have plans for doing an additional sampling in twenty twenty one? I can take that one. Uh, we are planning on continuing sampling and using some of the sites from this preliminary study to do. Um, Higher density sampling, as well as tempor as as well as tracking trends temporally, as well to understand um, not only getting a point estimate, but also looking at uh, how different adult and how different densities at different life stages may change over time. So um, yes, we're also planning on hopefully um, doing some work to jointly estimate host densities and tick abundance um, pairing deer density estimates with, um, with ticks as well. All right, um, thank you to all of you. And uh, we will be moving on to our next presentation. Hello, and welcome to a presentation on the competitiveness of multiflora rose compared with two cohabiting native plants. By two sophomores at Calvin University, Nathan Wilkes and Andrew Bannerteig, as well as a professor, Dr. Dornboss. So what is multiflora rose? Multiflora rose is an invasive rose fish originally brought over from Eastern Asia in the late 1800s. It can be identified by its very small white flowers as long as its small leaflets and its many thorns to keep out predators. Our goal this summer was to figure out how it works. We know that it grows in all sorts of different habitats, including meadows, a young forest, and mature forests with different light levels. It was brought over in the 30s as well as to be used for live fences, and has since then taken over 45 million acres of land in the eastern United States. It is able to do this because of its immense seed bank, releasing over half a million seeds annually. As mentioned earlier, not only is our goal to figure out how it works, but we'd like to inform land managers on how to best avoid it and best mitigate it if it, if it is already present. Our question for the summer was, what causes multiflora rose to outcompete native plants so well, and how do we best mitigate it? 
In order to answer this question that we've asked, we are choosing to compare multiflora rows to two native plants similar to the makeup of multiflora rows. We chose black cherry and Virginia creeper. Virginia creeper is on the left and black cherry is on the right. And we chose these plants because of their relative abundance and how they grow in common habitats to multiflora rows. These plants can be easily identified with their unique leaf or leaflet makeup and their bark of the tree. Now we chose two control groups being the native plants in order to compare against the multiflora rows so that we could have a baseline and see how multiflora rose is outcompeting or undercompeting compared to these normal native plants. As a side note, we would have liked to have black cherry leaves that were higher up in the canopy, but we couldn't reach them, so we ended up with a lot of black cherry saplings. In a similar way, we're going to take these three species and compare them in three different habitats, young forest, meadow, and mature forest. And we're doing this in order to see how they use light efficiently differently in these three locations and how they grow normally in comparison to these three locations. We have decided to identify young forests as having a lot of undergrowth, relatively thin trees, and a lot of ground cover. We decided to identify meadow as open prairies, lots of sunlight, and they would at least get sunlight, direct sunlight for at least half the day. So in a similar way, we're using edges because multiple rows seem to grow a lot more predominantly there and it got sun for most of the day. And for mature forests, there's relatively thick trees, almost no sunlight getting through and relatively low amounts of ground cover. How did we get all of this data? Well, we went around finding six different locations for each habitat mentioned on the last slide. At each location, we looked for a plant for each species, where we then found two sun leaves that we could scan from each plant to which we took data from. We started with the chlorophyll meter on the left, which does exactly as it sounds, collect the amount of chlorophyll for each leaf. We then moved on to the Lycor 6400 gas exchange meter, which collected the majority of our data this summer. It did many great things for us, such as measured the net photosynthesis, water use efficiency, and transpiration. We were able, able to control for many factors, such as the amount of carbon entering the leaf, as well as the temperature of the leaf. We did each of these at different light levels to see how efficient the leaf was at each, starting at zero and then going all the way up to 2000. We lastly used the line meter in the middle, which we used to measure how much light there was at each location to better categorize, categorize our locations for each habitat. Here is a map of all of our replicate locations where for each dot, um, all three species were located within a 10 meter um, area. And so on the top left of the map, we have our red dots, um, which are our meadow locations. And then um, mostly on the bottom left are our lime green dots, which are our young forest locations. And lastly, we have our purple dots, um, which are our old forest or mature forest locations. This is just some of the data collected from our light meter for the three different habitats. As you can see in the ranges, there was quite a bit of variability from habitat to habitat. But overall, the total light collected goes down from habitat to habitat, and the percent of the total sun available goes down from the meadow to young forest and the mature forest. So here is our main data graphed onto what we call light use efficiency curves. This measures the net photosynthesis of the plant at each different light level. So on the bottom left of the graph, we start with zero light which indicates aerobic respiration. Usually it's in the negatives because it actually costs a plant to stay alive with no light. We also look at the Pmax, or where the line is the highest, which indicates where the plant has the capacity for the most rapid growth. So you can see here that Virginia creeper in the gray line on the bottom actually doesn't need to do that much photosynthesis compared to the other two, but does max out around 1000, putting it in the middle ground. Black cherry, on the other hand, does much more rapid growth in photosynthesis in the early light levels, from roughly about 100 to 500. It outcompetes everyone, indicating how it thrives in the shade compared to the other two plant species. Lastly, our multiflora rose has a similar Pmax as black cherry, but does much better when exposed to more light and continues to do better from 750 on, 
indicating how it thrives in the sun. Here we have our same data as the last slide, but at this time it's broken up into different habitats. So you can see in the meta on the left, Virginia creeper is still lower than the rest as it is a shade loving plant, while multiflora rose and black cherry are very close in the meadow. And in the right, you can see it in comparison to a young forest where Virginia creeper starts to pick up amount, the amount of photosynthesis and black cherry's efficiency drops around 500. Again, multiflora rose continues to have the highest net photosynthesis at higher light levels, and its Pmax tends to be higher levels, meaning it does better in just overall more light. In our last habitat, the mature forest, the trends do stay the same. The overall number for amount of photosynthesis does drop from habitat to habitat, as seen on the x-axis compared to the last two slides, as less light is available. But again, Multiflora rose shows its affinity for the sun, and black cherry for the shade, and lower light levels. Here we have our chlorophyll content table, which has the average chlorophyll content for each of the plants, leaves, and from which we sampled. <clears throat> we again have it broken up by habitat. Multiflora rose has the lowest amount for each habitat, except for mature forest, but it still has the lowest on average. Black cherry, on the other hand, has the opposite and clearly has the highest for each habitat on average which we did right, we did see with all of our leaves, they were darker and more green, leaving the Virginia creeper on average in the middle, just above multiflora rose. Again, this further is evidence towards the idea that multiflora rose needs the most light and black cherry is the opposite and the most shade loving of our three, of our three species. Here we have a probability table showing all the different statistical data that we took throughout the summer and it shows us all the p-values and that from that information we could determine what is significant for our graphs and analysis. As you can see species circled, species by habitat circled, species by light by intensity, species by habitat by light intensity, and all of those numbers are below the 0 0.05 threshold so thus we can say that our data is significant. We believe that the data shows a significant amount of evidence that multiflora rose can handle more light, but does poorly in low light. Black cherry had Pmaxes at very low light levels and quickly falls off, showing just how much of a shade-loving plant it is, and how it is most efficient and thrives with not much light. The chlorophyll counts back this up, as multiflora rose had the least amount of chlorophyll, showing even more the amount of light and sun it needs, and black cherry with the highest counts. Our advice after seeing it firsthand, would be to do frequent burns to keep multiflora rose at bay in meadows. In any shady areas or forests, plant Virginia creeper or black cherry around the multiflora rose after killing it to minimize the amount of light hitting the seed bank or multiflora rose saplings. We believe that you can keep it away from where it does best, high light, then you will have greatest success in mitigating it. As for some acknowledgments, we'd like to acknowledge Pierce Cedar Creek Institute for allowing us to perform our research this summer on their location. And similarly, we would like to acknowledge Dr. David Dornboss and the Calvin University Biology Department for funding us and helping us and helping mentor us throughout the summer so we can get this project done in a timely and efficient manner. All right, <clears throat> thank you uh, for joining us, Andrew. You might need to turn your microphone on. Uh, and same with you, Nathan. Um, a quick question for you. I, I know this is just kind of from the Institute's perspective. One of the things we're working on is doing some oak regeneration. And um, one of the things you need for oak regeneration is light. Um, it seems like from your work, we'd also be making ourselves vulnerable to multiflora invasion. Um, is there anything that you might suggest that could help us help us uh, 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 have both, right? I mean, or maybe it's impossible, right? Can we can we have uh, more light and less multiflora rose? Um, unfortunately, I don't know a lot about the whole oak regeneration process, um, but um, I do think that it seems very challenging to be able to do both, um, just by the fact that. Um, it was just so clear that the most the most amount of light gives the most amount of growth to multiflora rose, and it can be seen all over Pierce's 
um, all over Pierce's property as well. Um, and so if you're doing, were you doing oak regeneration in what kind of habitat were you specifically thinking about? It, it would be forests. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, these are mostly established forests uh, that have some oak canopy, um, but making sure that the oaks themselves um, uh, 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 thrive. Yeah, I, from what we saw when we were in, walking through forests and doing surveying as well, um, just any pockets of light, even in a forest, um, those multiflora rose plants were thriving much better. So I think it would be pretty difficult to um, be able to do both. Um, but that's just based off of what we've seen and what the data shows. Um, I can't say anything for certain. Okay. One other quick question before we need to move on. Um, will multiflora rose survive if it is burned? From what we saw, um, not near as well because walking through your guys' prairies, um, there was not very much actually in the actual prairie or in the meadows. Um, from ones that we had heard about that have been recently burned. And so that's why we had to move to the edges actually, um, because those were untouched by fires. And so um, we kind of came to the conclusion from what we could best gather that if you um, basically chopped it down and, um, and then burned it at least, um, that would give you the best chance for uh, the most amount of years of it not thriving. Um, I can't say for certain if it's going to kill all the way, but it is definitely, um, from what we could tell, the best way to mitigate it. All right. Thank you uh, both. We are going to move on. And let's see. Here we go. Um, our next uh, presenter is Megan Nippa from Western Michigan University. Hello, my name is Megan Nippa. I'm a senior at Western Michigan University and this summer I did research on the establishment and success of the plant white wild indigo based on the present soil and microbial communities. I have been working under the guidance of my faculty mentor, Dr. Catherine Doherty, to uh, construct this pilot project on microbial ecology and I'm really excited to share this final report with you. So our environment of study and sampling for this project was the native prairie ecosystem. These ecosystems have the potential to house a high diversity of native plants that make up an important habitat for pollinators. In addition, they have the potential to sequester large amounts of carbon and will be a necessary resource for carbon storage as we attempt to mitigate the effects of climate change. However, these native ecosystems have been largely wiped out by agriculture and restoring them unfortunately is not very easy. One of the biggest reasons for this uh, turns out to be that when comparing an undisturbed native prairie to a prairie in the process of being restored after agricultural land use, undisturbed prairie soil contains a highly diverse community of soil microbial organisms. And there isn't a whole lot known about the ecology of these microorganisms or their interaction with the native plant community in a prairie. What we do know, however, is that in just one gram of prairie soil, we can find millions of microorganisms, whether they be bacteria or mycorrhizal fungi. We also know that the presence of these soil microbial communities is beneficial to plant communities because of the role they play in nutrient cycling and mineralization and in decomposition. The presence of these communities has been observed to increase plant biomass and community diversity. However, the consideration of these below ground communities is mostly left out of our current restoration practices. So we really wanna learn more about how we can use them to restore native prairie ecosystems. In this project, we did this by studying the plant white wild indigo and the associations it makes with soil microbial organisms. White wild indigo or Baptisia alba is a shrub like native prairie plant with spikes of white flowers. And it was the perfect plant for us to study, A, because it's a late successional species, which have a harder time establishing than early successional species and are likely to be more selective in their associations with soil microorganisms, and B, because it is known as something called nitrogen-fixing legume. Legumes are plants that form mutualisms, or mutually beneficial relationships, with bacteria in the soil called rhizobia. The rhizobia get carbohydrates from the roots of the plant for energy, and in return the plant receives a bioavailable form of nitrogen that's fixed by bacteria. And here we're interested in learning whether or not there are specific bacteria that associate with white wild indigo. Answering this question could potentially pave the way for more exploration of plant microbial interactions and in turn improve our understanding of prairie restoration by focusing on the below ground communities. 
An example of this would be to maybe produce um, like a microbial inoculum that plants could be treated with so they could benefit from these soil microbial mutualisms even in depleted soil. Our first hypothesis for this experiment was that the soil bacterial communities associated with white wild indigo within a site would converge to be more similar to one another than the soil bacterial communities not associated with white wild indigo within the same site. Or in other words, we predicted that the soil we collect from the base of white indigo plants would have a similar soil microbial community structure even at different locations in a field. Our second hypothesis was that the soil bacterial communities associated with white wild indigo across sites would converge to be more similar to one another than the soil bacterial communities not associated with white wild indigo across sites. This hypothesis is reflective of the first one just on a larger and more diverse scale. So we had four different study sites spread across southwest Michigan. And in order to find and gain access to these sites, we had to do a lot of reaching out and collaborating with experienced land managers who knew a lot about the sites. The four sites included a restored prairie called Barnhouse Prairie at the Edward Lowe Foundation, a restored prairie located on Western Michigan University's Parkview campus, a restored prairie on the property of Pierce Cedar Creek Institute, and finally a remnant prairie called Prairie Ron Savannah Plant Reserve, owned and managed by the Michigan Nature Association. When looking for different sites, um, we wanted to find a variety of different soil types to sample from, so we could also examine the effect that soil type could have on white wild indigo plants and present soil microbial communities. Once we located our sites and got permission to access them from land managers, we then went out and used a GPS unit to map the dispersal of white wild indigo plants in each prairie. Next, I would go home and use the coordinates we recorded to make a map of the white wild indigo at each site. Once a map was constructed, I designed the sample method based on the dispersal of white indigo throughout the field, and I had a couple of goals in mind while creating the sampling design. Uh, first, we wanted to sample areas in the field that were abundant with white indigo, as well as areas of the field that were lacking in white indigo. Doing this would allow us to compare these areas and get an idea about what could allow white indigo to grow in a certain location. Second, we wanted to sample soil associated with well-established white indigo plants spread throughout the field. Uh, by doing this, we can look specifically at the soil microbial communities associated with white wild indigo and see if they are comparable within and across sites. So once I constructed a sample design, we revisited each site to take plant measurements and sample soil cores. At each site, we took five white indigo associated samples and 15 non-white indigo associated samples along the transect lines we planned out based on the map of white indigo coordinates. Along with taking soil samples, we also measured the height of each white indigo plant, its width, the number of flower spikes it had, and the number of flower buds on each spike. We then also identified the plant community directly surrounding each plant. Um, as you can see in the picture on the right, we placed a 1 by 1 meter PVC pipe around the base of the white indigo plant and then identified every non-grassy plant species and its abundance within that perimeter. So we wrapped up sampling in late August and the next step was to conduct sample analysis. First, we sieved each individual soil sample to kind of standardize the texture for all the procedures and measurements we had to do, which included DNA extraction, uh, pH measurement, soil moisture content, soil organic matter content, and potassium chloride extraction. So due to COVID-19, there were some delays in lab work, and as a result, I haven't quite finished soil organic matter content or KCL extractions quite yet, um, but I'll be wrapping those up within the next couple weeks or so. And COVID-19, unfortunately, has also delayed the process by which we analyze and send in our DNA extractions to Michigan State for processing so we don't have the data on the microbial communities quite yet. In the meantime though, we have been able to analyze pH and soil moisture and the plant diversity data collected from each site. So here we have a figure representing our pH measurements both by site and by the type of sample, um, which is either white indigo associated soil sample, which is represented in green, or non-white indigo associated sample, which is yellow. After running some ANOVA tests, we found that average pH varied significantly by site with a p-value of less than 0.001, with all pairwise comparisons having a p-value of less than 0.003. Um, there was no significant difference found between white indigo associated soil pH versus non-white indigo associated soil pH, uh, which had a p-value of 0 0.0559. This figure here represents our soil moisture measurements, again by both site and type of sample. 
We again ran some ANOVA tests and found that average soil moisture differed significantly by site with a p-value of less than 0 .0001. However, um, soil moisture also could have differed um, by date of sampling considering we had to sample each site at different dates, so that could have affected these results. Um, and we found that there was no significant difference between white indigo associated soil moisture, again represented in green, and non-white indigo associated soil moisture represented in yellow, uh, which had a p-value of 0.272. In order to assess the diversity of the plant communities immediately surrounding white wild indigo, I calculated the Shannon's diversity index for each 1 by 1 meter plot around each white wild indigo plant. I then calculated the average Shannon's diversity index of the five plant communities for each site. After running ANOVA tests on these numbers, we found that the average plant diversity differed significantly by site with a p-value of 0 0.0283. We also found that Prairie Rond, our remnant prairie, had a significantly higher average Shannon's diversity index than Barnhouse with a p-value of 0 0.0456 and Parkview with a p-value of 0 0.037. Um, however, uh, our remnant prairie did not differ significantly from the Pierce Cedar Creek site with a p-value of 0.177. It is worth noting that the remnant prairie we sampled, Prairie Rond, had the highest average Shannon's diversity index, um, which was to be expected considering remnants have been undisturbed by agriculture. Following the same trend, we also expect Prairie Rond to have the highest microbial diversity since its soil is also undisturbed. Aside from plant diversity, we also expect white wild indigo health and success to somehow correlate with soil microbial community structure. We determined the success and health of each white indigo plant using its measurements of height, width, number of flower spikes, and number of flower buds per spike. Even though several variables likely impact the health and success of white wild indigo, uh, we think that soil microbial community composition will have the most prominent impact because white indigo is a legume and is known to form mutualisms with these soil microbial communities. So I'm really excited to get our DNA sequences back and see the relationship that they have to the health of the plants we measured. As I mentioned, we will not have access to taxonomical data for the microbial communities for a little bit due to COVID-19 delays. However, I wanted to restate all the different variables we have pinned against each other for this project and the main relationship I expect to come out of them. Although there are several factors that can affect soil microbial community composition and the health of white wild indigo plants, such as um, soil moisture, soil pH, soil organic matter content, soil nutrient content, the amount of shade the plant receives, the diversity of the surrounding plant community, um, the date the prairie was established, and the date that the soil was sampled. I predict that the strongest relationship between variables will exist between the composition of the associated soil microbial communities and the presence or absence of white wild indigo. In other words, all variables listed here will likely interact, but I expect white indigo presence and soil community composition to be the most interdependent. The reason behind this prediction is that white wild indigo plants uh, happen to be late successional leguminous plant, so its likelihood of success is probably closely related to the associations it's able to form with microbes in the soil. So right now we are waiting for our DNA sequence data to come back to us from Michigan State University where it was processed and turned from small DNA extractions into data that we could see and use. Um, our next and final steps will be to create several multivariate ordinations and multilinear regressions that can help us determine the biggest indicators of white indigo health as well as microbial community composition. Finally, once we are able to analyze all our data, hopefully we'll be able to uh, reconnect with land managers and talk about how they can improve below ground restoration practices for white wild indigo. And this could be in the form of maybe, as I mentioned, an inoculum that could be applied to white indigo plants to help them establish in soils that have been depleted by agriculture. And that is all I have for my final report. I would like to say thank you to a couple people and organizations that I wouldn't have been able to do this project without. Uh, first, I want to say thank you to Pierce Cedar Creek Institute for giving me this amazing opportunity to do my own research and learn more about ecological restoration. Uh, thank you to Dr. Catherine Doherty, who guided me through this entire process and basically showed me all the ropes of experimental design and field work, as well as her lab group, who offered me a lot of help through the process. And finally, I'd like to thank the Michigan Nature Association, Western Michigan University, and the Edward Lowe Foundation for letting me use their land to sample and experiment and for working with me throughout the process. And of course, thank you all very much for listening.
All right, um, welcome, Megan. Um, a quick question for you. Um, I, I, I didn't notice fire um, in your uh, uh, in your analysis. Uh, will that be a uh, part of anything that you're looking for? Or does, do you know if fire has any impact on uh, micro, my, yeah, the microbiota? Um, so we did not really include that in our analysis. Uh, however, I know that there was some white indigo um, observed growing in a PCCI prairie after a burn. So I know that um, it was pretty successful after the prairie was burned. I'm not sure the effect that that has on the below ground soil community, but I would assume that it would be um, relatively undisturbed since it is protected below the ground from fire. All right. Um, let's see, I'm waiting for a question to pop up. I, d I don't see any. Um, so I'm just out of curiosity for, I guess maybe for my own sake, um, how long do you think it's going to take to get uh, some of these analyses back? Uh, we should get those back within the next couple of weeks. We sent them out already, and now it's just a matter of waiting. Um, we're not sure if the waiting time is going to be affected by COVID, uh, so it's kind of up in the air right now, but we expect it back pretty soon. All right. That sounds good. Um, we are going to actually move on to our next presentation, so thank you, Megan. Thank you. Uh, our next presentation is from um, uh, Michaela Curry uh, from Grand Valley State University. Michaela Corey, and I'm a graduate student at Grand Valley State University. I'm also a recipient of the Environmental Stewardship Grant offered by PCCI, and today we'll be talking to you about my thesis, which covers the spatial ecology and survival analysis of threatened spotted turtles in southwest Michigan. I'm going to be focusing on my first field season as I have two and this field season covered the spring, summer, and I'm currently working still on the fall so I won't be talking to you a little bit about the fall too much. It is a well-known fact that turtles and ancient species are a unique vertebrate that ubiquitously plays an important role in all ecosystems. Unfortunately, these creatures of exceptional morphological architecture are arguably the most threatened vertebrate in the world. Almost two-thirds of the 365 turtle species known are either threatened or extinct. Turtles face a myriad of threats that are accelerating their demise towards extinction. Factors such as urbanization, habitat loss, poaching and pet trade, and climate change are only some of the pressing issues that they're facing currently. My study really focuses on the endangered species um, known as spotted turtles, also known as Clemmys guttata. The spotted turtle is endemic to the northeastern seaboard and also the Midwest of the uh, United States and southern portions of Ontario and Canada. In focusing currently in Michigan, because that's where my study is focusing on, there, since 1921, there was 40 counties with sightings of spotted turtles. However, since 2016, there's only six counties with sightings, which can only lead to us to believe that there is a very fast acceleration of their decline. As a result, my study focuses on a specific population in southwest Michigan to <clears throat> better grasp their spatial ecology and survival estimates to improve their conservation for future management plans of this cryptic species. So first and foremost, we must identify habitat preferences of this species in order to properly understand their spatial ecology. Spotted turtles are found in marshy areas with shallow aquatic habitat that is abundant in vegetation. So this includes bogs, vernal pools, fens, and encompassing wet, uh, upland and wet, wetter forests. Within these areas provide accessible food uh, preferences that specifies um, these turtles' diets, which includes algae, soft aquatic plants, worms, aquatic insect larvae, tadpoles, and carrion. My study specifically focuses on a population that occupies a fen, upland forest, and vernal pool. This population was studied about actually 12 years ago by a professor in Alma College named John Rowe, and uh, much has changed since then. As this turtle uh, species is highly sensitive to pollutants, water toxins, um, habitat fragmentation, poaching, and rapid change of climate, a follow-up study is much needed after a decade of not being studied. 
Therefore, my hypotheses and objectives of my study focus on that there will be a notable difference in the temporal and spatial movement patterns between two field seasons of the same population as a result of climate, a change of climate and habitat fragmentation to a study um, compared to a study conducted in the same population about 10 years ago and that turtles will select sites of high thermal quality with higher percentages of easily accessible cover types for refugee. So I started off my study with a three day consecutive trapping event using Promar hoop nets and or tra uh, ca capturing by hand as they are pretty easy to grab. Um, I captured over uh, quite a bit of turtles and I collected morphometric data on them and sex and tried to identify their age using annual, um, annual marking on their plastron if they weren't smoothed out by very old age. I also would collect the um, carapace, also known as shell, length and width, length, uh, carapace height, and then also plastron, which is their underside, length and width as well in millimeters in order to estimate um, the population's average size. I then proceeded to tag 20 of the turtles. I adhered a small transmitter that was less than 5% of their body weight, including a two-part uh, JB weld epoxy. And I then proceeded to paint it black in order to match it uh, well with its shell and then not make it more distinguishable in the environment it was in. And the transmitters are very easily uh, movable and so um, they were not inhibiting their movement when out in the field. So going into the field, um, uh, preceding their relocation, I would continue to relocate turtles um, and collect their movement using a handheld radio receiver. My receiver allowed me to um, focus where their transmitters are by sending out a beam um, using a type of gain uh, and strength of gain to observe where they were out in the field. I data, uh, my data was collected and I would go out and search for tur turtles every two to three days until movement patterns really slowed down. Then I would go from one to two days um, in between, or sorry, uh, one to two days a week. And uh, that was usually when uh, either they're estimating or they're uh, completely slowed down um, during the season. So during these times, I would collect weather conditions, microhabitat, which include deer trail, fen, um, vernal pool, etc., ambient temperature, substrate temperature, and then vegetation cover and types. Um, I then proceeded to take paired location in order to observe the available habitat that they were using versus, um, or they, that they were not using versus uh, what they were using and compare those habitats to see if these available habitats that they weren't currently using were uh, similar to the ones that they were. I then would take location points to be projected in a GIS map. And lucky for you, I have some GIS maps ready to show um, to observe the movements of these turtles. So to start, we have the female home ranges of the spring and summer 2020. And you can see here we have 10 females um, that occupy the fen. You can see here, this is a centralized location. It's actually the vernal pool. And you can see the females, uh, they travel quite a bit of, uh, of area and they occupy quite a bit of area, really specifying in the deciduous forest vernal pool area, along with a scrub and shrub wetland. The males, you can see, were a little bit more widely dispersed. Um, that can be as a result of male uh, regression and male competition for mating. Again, they were quite um, uh, collectively in the vernal pool for a little bit, and then they all started to disperse out. Again, that could be for mating reasons. So comparing the spring, um, uh, spring comparisons for sex, we can see they still had quite a bit of range. Uh, males were a little bit wider. You can see one really kind of took a toll and moved quite a bit. Um, and so we can see that uh, reasons for this can be for, especially in spring, um, this was like spring because unfortunately you couldn't get any data for the early spring as a result of COVID, um, it was that this could be as a result of mating and for, for females for nesting as well. The males really moving far to go and find a mate. Uh, you can see kind of some similarities here too. And then um, in the summer, 
we can see a kind of a more of a dispersal uh, because it's hot. They want to bask in the vernal pool. And as the summer started to slow uh, to increase in temperature, the vernal pool actually ended up drying up at the end of the summer. And so we really saw a push of the turtles leaving the vernal pool, especially when times got hot. And we saw them estivating, which means that it's like a short term hibernation for these um, any type of reptile. Uh, in order to uh, avoid desiccation. And so they really are um, hung out in these sphagnum mounds that are moist and cool in the fen. And we can see that some of the females really moved far in the summer along with the males and really utilizing some uh, vernal pools actually back here and some forest areas over here as well. Comparing to the 2007 study, this is uh, actually John Rowe's um, home range availability of uh, the turtles he studied 2007. Um, I don't unfortunately have the turtle identification numbers, but um, I do have this and it kind of shows a very similar triangular pattern with them kind of focusing on the vernal pool and uh, end up, uh, a lot of them end up in this very right corner, um, obviously probably to overwinter. So the largest home range size was actually an adult male, which was our one, his name was 102. And his uh, home range area consisted of, uh, in the spring, which uh, 5.7 hectares, and the summer, summer was 1.5 hectares. So what we know right now is that um, my uh, estimate of the population is about 50 turtles. So that was about uh, from this year. 15 were actually still alive from 12 years ago from what we've captured, but there's a ton of new turtles, which is amazing which means a brand new, it's a newer population. Um, the sex ratio is about 60 to 40, predominantly female, which is pretty common in any type of a turtle population. The average adult female weight was about 110 grams versus the male was 117, which is kind of interesting because um, in literature, it has been reported that the females are on average larger than the males. So this population, the males are larger than the females. And lastly, we really noticed that they move uh, far after heavy precipitation events as well. So overall, I'm really excited to continue to study this population and gather more uh, information and uh, really excited to propose some management plans later on because of this uh, study as well. So if you have any questions, let me know. All right. Uh, McCulloch, if you could turn your uh, microphone on. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for one quick question. Um, if you could give uh, the Institute three actions they could take to better support uh, turtle populations, um, both uh, it could be spotted or just in general, um, what advice would you give us? Or I guess in this could also be any landowner that has a turtle pond or something like that at it. Sure. Um, I would recommend increasing landscape connectivity as we have seen a lot of fragmentation um, affecting uh, these populations. And so it, increasing connectivity between the landscapes would be uh, a big number one. Um, monitoring the populations and where they're nesting too and placing cages over the nesting so it protects the populations because as said before in uh, previous pre presentations, um, uh, head starting and uh, younger populations, years dying. Oh man, um, <laughs> younger populations it, uh, don't have as much of a higher percentage of survivability, unfortunately. And then um, lastly, I think education would be really important for um, landscape owners, just learning about the turtles, learning uh, what landscapes that they preference and where they're, you know, especially with turtle crossing, um, you know, just learning all about that and what to do and not to capture uh, these turtles. And um, yeah, just uh, informing the public about it. I think that would be my third advice. All right. Um, thank you uh, for your presentation and for your uh, uh, time here. Um, we want to get uh, done as close to 1.30 as possible. We're going to probably be about five to 10 minutes over. Um, uh, and I'm going to uh, uh, start our final presentation in just a second here. Um, there we Hello, go. my name is Josh Arnold and I'm a graduate student at Grand Valley State University working with Dr. Eric Snyder. Today I'll be giving a progress report on my thesis project assessing the short-term effects of translocation on freshwater mussels. 
For some background on this project, North America is widely considered to be the global biodiversity hotspot for freshwater mussels, with roughly 300 species of native mussels. Michigan alone has 42 native species of mussels. Freshwater mussels provide many ecosystem services, such as filtering water, help stabilizing substrate, and are food for many species of fish and birds and mammals. However, freshwater mussels are widely considered to be the most imperiled group of animals in North America. Of the 300 species, roughly 70% are currently facing extinction and are listed at either the state or federal level. In addition, at least 10% of species have, are considered to have gone extinct in the past 150 years alone. This dramatic decline in mussel populations has been contributed to historical over-exploitation for freshwater pearls and buttons, wide-scale habitat alteration in the forms of dams and channelization, and the introduction of invasive species such as zebra mussels and round gobies. A common practice to save mussel populations threatened with extirpation due to human causes is translocation. Translocation is the act of moving all individuals in an infected area to a new place where they will be safe. Translocation has been used since the early 1900s, but has had varying levels of success, with some instances having greater than 90% of mussels surviving for five years, while other cases having total loss. Previous studies have only looked at mortality to judge success. This is where my project comes in. My project will look at the short-term effects, such as changes in growth rates, as well as mortality, and see how differences in habitat and water quality from the translocation site to the new sites can affect these overall effects. For this study, we surveyed several sites throughout the Thorn Apple watershed colored in tan and the Cedar Creek watershed colored in green. These sites listed are just the ones that required more in-depth surveys, such as quantifying habitat and water quality. Many other sites were also qualitatively surveyed for mussels, but no further surveys took place once they were determined to not be suitable for mussel habitation. For quantifying habitat, one of the tests we use is the Wolman pebble count. Wolman pebble counts is where you randomly select 100 particles of substrate and measure along their intermediate width. With this information, you can calculate the average substrate size located at each site as well as to determine the range of substrates present at each site. With this information, we can compare the various substrates across the sites. In addition, we also calculated discharge at each site near base flow. With discharge, you can also calculate shear stress or the amount of force needed to move different size particles. Level loggers will also be installed at each site in order to track flow for the next several months. In order to quantify water quality at the various sites, water grabs were used to quantify nutrients such as ammonia, nitrates, and soluble reactive phosphates. This analysis was done by Grand Valley State University's Annis Water Resources Institute located in Muskegon. In addition, parameters such as temperature, pH, DO were measured using a handheld YSI multi-parameter anytime we were out in the field. Temperature loggers were also installed at each site and they take a temperature reading on an hourly basis to compare water temperature between the sites. Now for the actual translocation effort. Initially for this project, we wanted to use 500 individuals, but Michigan Department of Natural Resources requested that we limit it to 200 individuals. In late June, 200 spikes, a common species of mussel here in Michigan, were collected and each had a pit tag attached to the left hull of the shell using a two-part marine epoxy. All mussels were then measured weight and a subset or age in order to create a length age chart. 50 individuals were then placed back into the control site and the remaining 150 were split among the three experimental sites. In order to track changes in the tagged mussels, they will be recollected twice, once in the end of September, which was recently completed, and again in early June of 2021. This is done by using a pit tag reader and a waterproof pit tag antenna to locate the mussels. Once located, the mussels are dug up. Once collected, they are again measured and weighed and checked for mortality. All living mussels are then replaced back into the sites. 
Now finally for some results. For habitat, there is a wide range of substrates at the varying sites, with some sites being dominated by very fine substrates such as the boat launch site and other sites being dominated by much larger substrate such as the spillway site. Uh, discharge was very similar across all sites based on stream order and the stars represent sites that were selected for the translocation effort. For water quality, sites within the same watershed have similar water qualities as expected. Broadway and McKean are both within the Cedar Creek watershed and have similar water qualities, which was also expected. The rest of the sites are within Thornapple River and there are some differences. Dam, Boat Launch, and Snyder site are all located within a few river miles of each other and have very similar water qualities while railroad and spillway site are several river miles downstream and the water quality differs. Water quality was not collected at Ben's site as it was only a few hundred yards downstream of the Broadway site and water quality, especially water nutrients, is assumed to be the same. With the data from the habitat and water quality, four sites were selected. The Broadway site was selected to be controlled due to the high densities of freshwater mussels present at the site. The Bend site was selected for similar habitat and similar water quality. The McKeon Bridge site was selected for similar water quality and dissimilar habitat. And finally, the railroad site on the Thorn Apple was selected for dissimilar habitat and dissimilar water quality. For the September monitoring, we resurveyed control and Bend sites on Thursday, September 24th, and the McKeon and Railroad sites on September 25th. At the first three sites, Control, Bend, and McKeon, we had a rather high recovery rate of 149 mussels recovered out of a possible 150. In addition, we also had a rather high survival rate at these three sites of 149 out of 150 possible mussels. The Railroad site, however, was a completely different story. Only 45 out of possible 50 mussels were recovered, and of those that were recovered, over 25% of the individuals were either dead or dying. I have not had time yet to go into great deal statistics, but the stats listed here are from a one-way ANOVA or an analysis of variance looking at the variation in changes in length between the sites. From the p-value, we can see there is a significant difference in the growth rates between the sites. There is still plenty of work that needs to be done for this project. An additional round of nutrient analysis will be done in the near future, this time only focusing on the four sites instead of all sites throughout the watershed. As previously mentioned, level logger still needs to be installed at the railroad site as Pierce Cedar Creek Institute has installed them at the other sites as part of the watershed management project. And finally, a final round of monitoring will need to be done in June of 2021 in order to track final changes in growth of the translocated mussels. I would like to take a minute to thank all those who have helped with the development of this project, namely my graduate committee, including Dr. Eric Snyder, Dr. Mark Ludington, Joseph Rathbun, and Wendy Ogilvie. And I would also like to thank all those who have helped me with fieldwork on this project so far. In addition, I would like to thank Mich Michigan Space Grant Consortium, Pierce Cedar Creek Institute and Grand Valley State University Graduate School for funding this project. And finally, I would like to thank all of you for attending today's events. If you have any questions about my work, please feel free to ask any questions at the end of this presentation or send me an email at the email address listed below. And once again, thank you for attending today's events. So Josh, uh, thank you for joining us. Um, I had a question for you. Um, uh, since you're working just with spikes, uh, do you think that uh, this would also, um, that you'd maybe find similar results with other mussels um, or other species of mussels that uh, uh, live in creeks and rivers? Uh, yes, and to a point, spikes are one of the more hardier species. That's why I think the DNR was willing to let us use spikes versus other species. But I imagine more common species such as spikes or pocketbooks that are also found in Cedar Creek would have similar results. But if we use uh, federally endangered and more sensitive species, I imagine the results would be different with higher levels of mortality. Okay. Um, 
what uh, a question from um, from Sarah. Uh, what do you think the long term survival prospects are for mussels at the Institute and throughout Berry County? Uh, long term, I think the water quality is fairly good in Berry County. So I think there's high levels uh, that they will continue to survive as long as there isn't increased development in the area, especially at Cedar Creek. The Broadway site has really high densities, upwards of 30 mussels per square meter. So that means they're in good densities. There are a couple of sites throughout Cedar Creek where there are no mussels and we did move mussels into there. Hopefully that will help head start a new mussel population at these sites. Are there, again, we, we talked about turtles and risks for turtles. Um, what are the biggest risks um, within uh, a creek, uh, uh, within Cedar Creek or within Berry County? Uh, I would say within Cedar Creek specifically would be increased development, which would lead to higher levels of sedimentation, which basically effectively bury the mussels and they cannot get up to the surface to basically eat. In Berry County, it would be the same way, increased development of farming or sedimentation would be the biggest risks. All right. Well, uh, Josh, thank you for your time uh, and for joining us. Uh, and thank you for all of you who uh, participated in the program today, um, who asked questions, who saw these videos. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed it. Um, just want to uh, also let you know that if you missed any of these questions or you want to revisit or, or share this with someone, uh, we will be putting this on YouTube. And so you will be able to uh, watch this um, uh, in, so on. If you do have any questions that didn't get answered or something comes up, uh, you're welcome to get into contact with me uh, um, through email. That's dykstram at cedarcreekinstitute.org. And I will uh, be happy to either pass along questions or facilitate um, some communication between uh, you and the researchers. Uh, thank you. And we hope to see you again sometime soon at another program.